Okay. Um, yeah. If I can have everybody's attention, please. All of our technical difficulties have been corrected for the time being. So we'll go ahead and get started, and I will ask uh, uh, Senator Hickman, if he would, to open this meeting with prayer. Yeah. If y'all would, please pray with me. Hey, Father, what a great day you've given us. Lord, you've given us a day to get up in the morning. Lord, you provide the fresh air for us to breathe. Lord, we just ask you to, to give us the wisdom and guidance, Lord, that we will honor you in everything that we say and do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. And we're... Uh, Got a couple of bills we're going to listen to today. These are going to be um, hearings only. Um, we've got uh, waiting on a couple of things from from substitutes that happened, and some of our folks are on tight schedules. And we needed to get the technical difficulties worked out so that the millions of Georgians watching this online <laughs> will stay abreast of all changes in employee pensions throughout the state of Georgia. Um, what we're going to start with is uh, start with SB 84 um, with Chairman Albers and our good friend Mr. Nix with the uh, Georgia Office of Homeland Security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, esteemed members of your committee. Thank you for uh, having us today to talk about uh, Senate Bill 84. One of the most important components of protecting the public are the men and women that answer the call when you dial 911. Those men and women have one of the most stressful jobs in the nation. In fact, just a couple of days ago, they were ranked in the top five most stressful jobs a person can have. Now, some people think that's a simple job, that they answer the telephone, and they type in a few things, and they get on the radio. That couldn't be further from the truth. These heroes, these men and women, are logistically, figuratively, and literally saving people's lives by giving them real-time guidance on what to do and how to do it, while simultaneously coordinating with multiple agencies and potentially multiple jurisdictions and they are really a key component to public safety. When we think about first responders, we often think about our law enforcement and our firefighters and then our EMS. But our 911 operators or dispatches are the fourth part of that stool, and it will literally fall over without them. This bill, which was worked on by you, Mr. Chairman, myself, and others with broad support from the Senate, as well as I want to give a lot of credit today to Mr. Michael Nix sitting next to me, who has been a champion for our dispatchers all over the state, seeks to allow those very heroes to be, participate in the same police officer annuity benefit fund that our law enforcement officers get to do today, the POAB, an extraordinarily successful program that I think you will hear from some of those folks as well that will allow them to make a career in public safety. Anyone who chooses a job in public safety decided they were going to put service above self and especially above fame or fortune. Keeping good men and women in these jobs is increasingly more difficult, especially with the extraordinary stress and the exceptionally competitive job market. I want to add one more component, though, that we forget about. Oftentimes, someone wants to serve as a firefighter, a police officer, EMT, or paramedic. And they're not able to at that time for a variety of reasons. They might not have been able to pass the necessary testing or education. And they might start out as a dispatcher and then continue to grow, learn, and then move into yet a different position. Likewise, we might have somebody who's been on the job for 10, 20, or even 30 years who is unable to perform some of the physical duties of that job that now can transition all that experience into a 911 center. As public safety as a whole evolves and we start bringing these things together, we're going to have more folks that are cross-strained in order to help you because the reality is when you need help, you want to make sure whoever is coming 
is going to be able to best protect, heal, help, or transport you or your loved one. Senate Bill 84 has a committee substitute. And with that committee substitute, the actuary study is being updated. And I hope, Mr. Chairman, to be requesting to you and your committee next week to get a vote on this bill because we are 100% confident that that study is going to come back very favorable. But with this, I want to commend Mr. Nix again, who instead of us raising the original fee we intended to do, we're not doing that. Uh, we have found other funding sources to do that, and I'll let him talk about that a little bit more. To me, this is really a no-brainer because in Georgia, we care about all of our first responders, whether they're taking the call, delivering someone to the hospital, protecting somebody's lives, or putting out a fire. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll yield for questions. Any questions for Chairman Albers? All right, not seeing any. We'll move over to uh, Michael Nix. Appreciate it. So, uh, again, my name is Michael Nix. I am the State 911 Director uh, at the Georgia Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency I and serve as uh, the State Director and support 150 plus locally managed 911 centers. Uh, there's been a staffing problem at our 911 centers across the state and nation for several years, and the COVID 19 pandemic has only made that problem worse. On, on more than one occasion here in here in Georgia within the last few months we've had centers that have had to transfer calls from one center to another because they didn't have the staff to be able to take the calls uh, themselves additionally many agencies have mandatory overtime policies in place which can does and has led to staff burnout employee wellness concerns and increased turnover we're hoping that through Senate Bill 84 we're able to help our 911 centers recruit and retain more 911 call takers and dispatchers they're the first first responders and are, most, and are most citizens' first interaction with public safety in an emergency and are oftentimes traditional first responders' lifeline for additional support and safety. This bill would help show the real appreciation for these amazing life-saving work that communications officers do 24 hours a day by providing a supplemental retirement benefit. Senate Bill 84 uh, would direct a portion of the 911 fees that are collected uh, by my office uh, to the Peace Officer Annuity and Benefit Fund uh, to cover the actuarial cost of adding communications officers to the fund. Currently, 97% of these fees go to the local governments that operate the 911 centers. 1% is retained by uh, my authority. 1% uh, is retained by the wireless and wireline uh, service suppliers and carriers to defray administrative costs. And then 1% is kept uh, by the Department of Revenue uh, for their uh, administrative cost of aggregating all of the 911 fees across the state. However, with Department of Revenues, their 1% is truly not retained by the agency, but is instead deposited in the state treasury for future appropriation. And so what we're looking to do in this bill uh, is to redirect uh, 0.75% of the Department of Revenue's 1% to, to cover the cost into POAB and allow the agency to still retain the 0.25% uh, the uh, that they have currently. Dollars-wise, an estimated $1.6 million would be directed to POAB and the, and the uh, leftover uh, would be deposited in the state treasury for future appropriation to the Department of Revenue. As you all know, the, the actuarial study uh, said it would take $1.2 million to cover the cost of adding uh, an estimated third of the eligible post-certified communications officers. And so this more than covers the uh, estimated actuarial cost and provides us room for growth in the future in the hopes that we're able to get more than one-third of communications officers a part of it. Uh, Right now, the third, the one third number uh, is generated uh, from the actuarial firm because unfortunately that's only the, about the number of peace officers and jailers that are a member of the fund. Uh, so we use that same number to calculate the estimate for uh, communications officers. Uh, and just to, to be clear for the local governments, there's no new money being taken out of the local government's percentage and we're simply using a piece that's already retained uh, already to to cover the cost for uh, adding communications officers. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Nix. And I'm, I'm sure you've spoken to uh, Revenue, and, and they're um, more than happy to move 0.75. Uh, and since they don't keep it, they don't. Since they don't get to keep it, they, they well, really don't have a have a stake in it. But yes, I've spoken and, with Commissioner. And Fred when too. you say they don't get to keep it, and they move it over into for future appropriations, you're talking about the general fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they right. have to deposit it into the treasury and then hope it gets back to them. Okay. Currently, um, 
officers can can within the fund within a certain period of time can buy back time will dispatchers be in placed into this fund will they have the opportunity to buy back time or is it day one fresh because it's a new benefit day one fresh because it's a new benefit similar to what how it is for jailers when they joined the fund okay and um any other questions from senators I, I see the the money man, um, <laughs> Director Homer Bryson, uh, sitting in the back, um, and I, you know, I, Director Bryson, do you have any comments or concerns with this legislation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, no, we do not. We have been uh, working with the senator and with Michael on this for nearly a year now. We think it's the right thing to do for these folks. They have a difficult job and think they've definitely earned it. And the challenge for us has always been um, how do you bring in additional members to a, a fund and not hurt the, you know, the fund and the current members. And I think that Michael has come up with a creative solution to that and we fully support the bill thank you and to be clear uh chairman albers we're working off lc 4317 <laughs> 63 uh, you know mr <laughs> yeah. mr chairman i did not bring a copy of the bill with me my apologies i was running from another committee okay. uh, but it is the most recent sub that was provided by uh, our legislative council Okay, well, I'm showing well, well, LC yeah. 431763 is the latest, and what we will be looking at next Wednesday, my understanding, will be a committee sub of this that includes the 0.75 mm -hmm. redirection. That's right. Okay. And that's just has to go to actuarial study, and I've been in touch with audits and the actuarial firm to make sure that we will move on that, be able to move on that quickly. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator Hickman, what number are you on there? Five. Can I just? And then th this is this is outside of this. But one of the things, and, and I guess we're through with discussion on this. But one of the things I picked up was that that we're uh, not pushing, but uh, looking at putting something in place that all nine one one op nine one one operators, when they answer the phone, will also be qualified to do CPR on the phone. And so they can they can take family members and work them through the CPR process until the EMTs get there. Is that is that still moving on? That's, yeah, that's, that's, a, a, that's a separate piece yeah, of legislation. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. I, I know that. But, but, but since we got you here, is what I want to ask. You. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think yeah. The, the senator from the 29th will be carrying that legislation. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, Moved you pass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wrong committee i think it'll be in front of you mr chairman yeah, i okay. just uh, so, so, yeah, good, so, yeah. so we are moving with it yeah that'll that'll be a separate piece good. of legislation that we've been working yeah, with good. the american heart association yeah thank you mr chairman and, and that's something that's something mr nix will be heavily involved with because uh, the first thing i brought up is the fact of if there would be any expense on that and but we do we are clear on the lc number and i do find it ironic that 1763 being the last four numbers is the same year uh, director bryson started working for the state <laughs> yeah, so uh I think I think that, that must be a sign. <laughs> but uh, we'll see y'all back here next Wednesday. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What what mic? Oh, sorry. Y yes, ma'am. I just have a question that's not directly related to the bill, but this director Bryson, did he change jobs? Uh, which time? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was not. I, was, I told everybody he has he has held more jobs than anybody I know and has never missed a day of work. But point of point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just how many uh, pensions can one state employee receive? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there's only one subject matter expert in this room that can answer that question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But I, but I will say this, it would be the individual that's responsible for my pension, so I'm going to step away from the answer in that question. So, so in all seriousness, yes, he was GEMA, right? Uh, no, ma'am. He was what? D, yeah. He was DNR. Then DNR. He was, then he was... Corrections. 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 Then he was GEMA, GEMA, and now he's over the Peace Officer Duty Benefit Fund. Wow, okay. So I remember right. him from GEMA. I get well, to work with my old boss again, so... <laughs> but I will tell you this, all joking aside, I... I, I got to know uh, director Bryson very early in my law enforcement career and got to got to be one of his students at the command college in, in Columbus State University and 
I think it says a lot for that we have state employees that under different regimes, different governors and everything, uh, people realize the wealth of knowledge and experience and they move them into those places. And, and uh, uh, I, I think he does an exceptional job of managing such a fragile fund and taking care of it. And I appreciate um, Chairman Albers and, and Mr. Nix from working with uh, Director Bryson and, and getting this thing moving. And that means a lot and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move from the simple to <laughs> Senator uh, Chairman uh, Huffstadler's legislation, um, which is going to be Senate Bill 343, post-retirement benefit adjustments. Um, number seven here, I believe. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to give a little bit of background on this, but first I want to say sometimes you work on a bill for four years and then the last year house member comes in and puts the identical bill in and that's the one that passes surprise billing but um i, I do want to i do want to say that this is the opposite here a bunch of people have put in a lot of work on this bill and i'm happen to be the one that's carry it so uh i appreciate the chair and uh his uh committee's study work on it uh senator orock who was part of that and has had a bill, um, those in the governor's office, OPB, ERS, and the retirees, and a lot of people have worked on this issue to bring it forward. And this is, I think, a historic moment because the last change was in 2009, and um, I'm one of those, I got off the county commission in 2006, I got in the state in 2013, I missed all those misery years where I hear the, the revenue was down to a, a day's funds on hands at some times, and there were drastic changes made. And uh, because of the uh, revenue increase that we've had, um, it's time to where we can do some things, as you're seeing with the employee raises. And whether you think it's the stimulus money or you, you, know, you think it's the, uh, the booming economy, uh, Marketplace Facilitator, as you know, has brought in over a, a billion dollars. Uh, the DOR is getting a lot of money from uh, uh, data analytics that's improved. A lot of things have helped. I, I, some people may think it's because Homer Bryson's now on the Board of Trustees since 2019. Maybe that's the difference why we've got money. I don't know. Another one of his hats he wears. Uh, but uh, all those things together have put Georgia in a much better shape to be looking at something like this to try to come back and, and improve things for our employees here. So the bill itself, if I can go through it uh, in a systematic manner, I hope, uh, we can look at that, and if you look in uh, line two and three there, one of the things we're doing is we're removing the prohibition against post-retirement benefits. Those that came in during 2009 when drastic cuts were being made were not eligible for COLAs. That's changed under this bill. Um, if you uh, go down to line six there, we're, we're revising provisions related to employer contributions for um, forfeited leave, and I'll explain a little bit more of that later. Number three there, we're increasing the rate of employer contributions to 401ks. The fourth thing that is not in this bill because it's gonna be in the ARS bylaws is, is the changes in their bylaws to uh, improve the system, the money that's been put into appropriations in the governor's budget to assist with this and be able to start looking forward to some COLAs. So um, if I go to the second page, you see the things underlined 19 and, and 25, that's just to make it gender neutral. Maybe in the future we'll add three or four categories to that, I don't know, but right now we're still there. Line uh, 29 is a big change there where it says that they aren't eligible for uh, benefits that were granted. This is saying that we're gonna let them now be eligible for COLAs, those after 2009, but um, anything that was granted prior to July 1st of this year they won't take part in, but after that, they would be eligible for uh, cost of living increases. Uh, no change there. At the rest of that page, if you go to uh, line 57, um, we're saying that retirements that become effective prior to July 1st, 2022, and that whole six lines there is one sentence, which our, our lawyer does. My English teacher would chew me out for that, but. Um, they, they do this, but basically what it's saying is that we're going to pre-fund uh, forfeited leave. 
So if the money's there, you've got a situation where somebody works here. I'll, I'll leave Homer out of this one that changes jobs, we're, we're just saying. But they, they work here 30 years, maybe 29 for one department, one year for another department. They've got 40 weeks of accumulated leave, and the guy with that little department has to pay all 40 weeks out of his budget. We're going to have that money there pre-funded after July 1st, and we're going to have to put some money in there to, to, to catch back up on that money. But it will actually save us money in the long run because we're also going to make investment money off of that, and it's going to be better for the state of Georgia to have it in there. And so that when somebody leaves, that money is already in the fund and doesn't have to be brought forth. Um, then if you go to line uh, 46, we're saying any member who contribute, takes a percent, contributes a percentage, um, it's been a five and three match. If, if we put in, if the employee puts in five, then the employer for the, the, who is the state of Georgia has been putting in three. We're going to go to five to five, and then we're going to make it a half percent more each year through year 13. So if you've been here 13 years, it will be a five to nine match. Um, and um, unfortunately, it's not that much money because not that many people stay here 13 years, but maybe that will change and we'll have better employee retention on that. Um, and um, this will apply to the judicial retirement and the legislative as far as uh, COLAs, but the 401ks have nothing to do with those funds. That's simply the ERS funds that would that would be part of that. Um, and that that's what section five is talking about judicial section four is talking about the uh, legislative and with that that is the bill again the 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 cola for the retirees is going to be in the bylaws from the ers it's not actually in this bill because that needs to be put in the bylaws um, i'll stop there and see if everybody's with me any questions from any committee member I'm not seeing any. Um, is there anybody wishing to speak on what is in the legislation? Jim, you want to come up? Uh, just hang on. Yeah. Yeah. Young, younger Jim. <clears throat> Jim, is that mic one? Yeah, it looks the same. Go ahead. I don't see a number. Can you hear me? Try it now. Can you hear me? No. All right, we're good now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you for saying younger, by the way. I hear that less and less frequently these days. <laughs> um, I want to, say, uh, to thank Senator Huffstetler for agreeing to carry this legislation for us. Um, I 100% agree with his comment that this is a real historic and turning point for uh, the ERS system and for many of the systems that we uh, currently administer. I'd like to, if I may, provide just a little bit of context for for uh, what's in the bill. There are essentially three problems that we're attempting to address. The first, the forfeited leave problem for employers. Uh, Senator Huffstetler explained that very well. We're trying to make life a little bit easier for them so they don't receive these large bills at the end of a an employee's employment period, you know, before retirement. And um, the equity issue that he described where you know the last employer currently has to pay for the entire career's worth of forfeited leave and we don't think that's right so that's the first thing the second thing again he described this very well the eligibility for colas for people who were hired into ers the judicial retirement system and the legislative retirement system on or after july 1 of 2009 uh, up until this point our boards are not authorized to provide COLAs for those people, and we would like to, to bring them into the fold so that all of our retirees would be eligible for COLAs based on the, the decision of the board and the funding being provided for that. Um, the um, change to the employer match, so I was approached by some folks within the administration about seeing what we could do from a retirement perspective to help address the recruiting and retention of state employees. These issues have been percolating, and I would, I would suggest coming to a head now over a number of months or even years, and 
um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be able to try to contribute to that with, with the change to the match that uh, is in the bill. Essentially, what we're trying to do is provide an incentive that would kick in each year of the employee's first 13 years of their employment. So for the first five years, they're becoming vested in the benefit, the employer match. In the next eight years, they're receiving a progressively better employer match, provided they continue to save the 5% uh, of their own pay. And just for uh, some context there, approximately 80% of our current GSEPs members already saved the 5%. So they're doing what they should be doing, and now the, the state is saying we would like to, to reward them for that and, and hopefully, in so doing, give them a really competitive uh, retirement program that, that would stack up against just about any employer, public or private. And I think, we, I think we're doing that. Um, so then the third thing, um, the COLAs, um, that is something that is not directly addressed in the, the bill, but if I may speak to that just a little bit, um, it's part of the, the whole package. So it's one thing to have people be eligible for a COLA, but we do need to see what steps we can take to um, actually provide one. And again, um, I was prompted by the administration to say, you know, what can we do? And what we've done is we've, we've come up with a model with our actuaries that is actually a dynamic model. I think the idea of providing a mandatory flat COLA every year is very difficult. Um, first of all, because we don't have any money currently in the fund designated for that purpose. Uh, we do not pre-fund COLAs, at least we have not up to this point. So whenever the board authorized a COLA, there was a back-end cost that would have to be paid for. And if the board were to authorize a COLA multiple years in a row, then those costs would stack on top of each other and become very difficult for the system to keep up with. So the real answer has always been pre-funding, but at this stage, the maturity of our system, that's a difficult, um, read expensive uh, proposition. Given the opportunity that we have now with the, the funding potentially being available, we are able to do that, but we wanna do it in a manner that um, reacts to sort of the environment that the fund is in. So as the fund um, has the financial wherewithal to provide a COLA, it will do so according to a set formula. And that formula result will, will be the result of several factors. The first is the investment performance of the system. We will have to maintain and meet a certain benchmark for investment performance over the prior five years in order to consider paying a COLA. The second is the funded percentage of the system. So the closer we are to being 100% funded, then the higher the, the possible COLA we would be comfortable in paying from a financial perspective. The third is the rate of inflation. It's not really an issue right now because inflation is quite high these days, but um, there have been periods, of course, in the past where inflation has varied quite dramatically. Um, and in you know, times of exceptionally low inflation, um, the COLA should reflect that. In higher inflation times, then the COLA would be able to, to increase to some degree. And then finally, the timing for when a COLA would be payable. In past years, ERS has typically paid COLAs in two installments, in July and in January. Um, we would propose to pay it in one installment in July. Um, these are all decisions that can be accomplished in the funding policy of the board. It's not something that has to be legislated. Um, we just feel like once a COLA payment has been identified, um, I'd just as soon pay it in one from, the, from a workflow perspective, and I think retirees would appreciate receiving the full benefit of a COLA earlier in the year uh, as well. In addition, for a new retiree, there would be a waiting period before they could receive their first COLA. So in general, that waiting period would be 12 months. Uh, they'd have to wait through one full year, one full COLA cycle before they could receive their first one. And if they happen to retire prior to the normal retirement age, usually age 60, but it can be at 30 years of service, if they retire prior to that on an early retirement, then they would have to wait until the date they would have reached normal retirement before they received the first COLA. Uh, so basically, retire early. That's, we're not changing those provisions. We're just saying that the first COLA wouldn't occur until a little bit later in their actual retirement. Uh, so those are the four. Um, again, all of what I just described to you can be accomplished by putting it into the funding policy of the board, which would then allow for the succeeding actuarial valuations to account for that cost, and it would become part of the regular employer costs paid for by the state on an ongoing basis. So I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. 
Any questions from the committee members? <clears throat> Jim, can you tell me um, what is required for the ERS bylaw changes? And when's the earliest that could, once uh, the legislation passes through? And of course, it's not tied to this particular piece of legislation at this time, but um, what, what's the mechanism to get those bylaws changed? So I plan to formally propose the changes to our funding policy to the board at our February <coughs> meeting. They would then have a couple of months to consider it, ask their questions, get comfortable with it, um, and we would ask them to approve those changes at our April meeting. Um, we also approved the next actuarial valuation at that April meeting, so that would be the first valuation under the new uh, funding policy. Um, and then finally, there are some uh, formal board rules that we file with the Secretary of State's office that we would need to update as well to make sure that they're in compliance with new legislation and the funding policy, and we would accomplish that by June. And so there would be a possibility that July 1, 2022, that these, these rules would be in place. That's correct. According to the timeline, by the time we get ready to pay the first call, of, all of this should be in place. Sounds great. Any questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, we will look at this legislation next Wednesday uh, for a vote as uh, committee members will have time to digest, research what they've um, heard today. Um, now, I know even though it's not in the legislation, I know I see our uh, retiree group is here. Do y'all have a spokesman that would like to give any comment on the legislation or on the proposed bylaw changes um, to the ERS? Yeah. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. And, and state your name, and nobody has to be known as Old Jim. <laughs> well, I got this gray hair after 34 years with the state, so I earned it. I don't mind being called old. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, esteemed members of the committee for the opportunity to come before you and speak on behalf of Senate Bill 343. I first want to thank uh, Senator Hustedler, uh, Senator Oreck, Chairman R Robinson, and others that have worked on this bill. Uh, we, as an organization, you may not know Georgia State Retirees Association, but we're a volunteer organization that advocates on behalf of retired and active state employees or individuals who obtain their health insurance through the state health benefit plan. And we're all state employees, all retired, and uh, we've long advocated for the removal of the prohibition against COLAs on the GSEPS plan. Uh, and we applaud Senator Hostetler and others for their willingness to put that into legislation. That will help the state in s some small part address the turnover rate that has reached historical proportions. So we thank you for that. The other thing we want to uh, also urge the committee to do is to support uh, Governor Kemp's bill, uh, budget that included a 111 or 118 million dollars and state funds to pre-fund the COLAs for retired state employees. Uh, we ask for your support as that moves through the legislative process. Now, with respect to the ERS's proposal of bylaw changes, uh, I won't get into detail about uh, where we stand on that because we are still talking to uh, Mr. Podvan about these and uh, hope that uh, we can come to some understanding to make it where the formula is more tilted towards the state retiree than it is to the benefit of the state of Georgia. The state of Georgia is the big 600 pound gorilla in the room and the state employee is the tiny little fella sitting in the corner with his hand and his, and his hat out asking to be given what he was promised. So we hope that we can come to some arrangement for that because uh, the median average, the median 
payout, yearly bench, pension payout for a retired state employee is $22,000 a year approximately. That's less than $2,000 a month. They've gone since 2009 without a cost of living increase. So that $22,000 is probably more like worth somewhere in the neighborhood maybe of $17,000. With that, they have to buy their medicine. And w as you all grow old like we are, you'll find that medicine becomes a big part of your budget. The food costs are going up. That's another thing. So we don't want our state employees who spend their careers serving the citizens of Georgia to have to make difficult choices between whether they take a half a pill to leave it to make sure it goes several months rather than one month, or they take what their doctor asks them to take. And I, we can give you examples of people that are facing that. So the important thing with the bylaws is that we hope that that, that 600 pound gorilla in the room becomes maybe a 400 pound gorilla and that state retiree sitting in the corner can put his hat back on his head and feed his family and take care of his elderly parents or prepare for a life in a retirement home or a nursing home. So I appreciate this committee's um, statue and, and support for both the a proper set of ERS bylaws that uh, protect the state employee and provide the state employee with what they were promised, economic security, and I hope you support Governor Kemp's budget of including money in for the prefund the COLA. And again, thank you, Senator Hostetler and Senator Oreck and Senator Robinson for uh, your bill and for the opportunity to speak before you. And uh, I'll leave it open if anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are we on? Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm Chuck Friedman, uh, Chair of the Legislative Committee, and thank you once again for the opportunity to speak before you. Uh, I am here for technical support, and you don't have to go through a lengthy uh, voice menu to get to me. So if you've got any questions that are of a technical nature, I'm here to answer them. Otherwise, Jim's, Jim said it very well. Well, thank you. And I'd like to I'd like to thank both of you for, for coming and, and being a part of this process as we move through. And I want to again thank everybody on this committee because since the uh, early 2000s, this, this issue has not moved. And, um, and I understand the, the power and the authority of the state, but I appreciate the men and women that serve on this committee that are willing to, to, to stand in the wind and challenge uh, things that seem uh, immovable and take practical steps to take care of the people that came and sacrificed their, their time, their sweat, their blood, and their tears to support the state. Uh, many of the citizens of the state of Georgia do not appreciate and do not recognize the amount of effort that it takes to run this state each and every day for them to enjoy the highways and byways and other benefits that exist because of state employees. And so we greatly appreciate y'all for representing those men and women and for coming here and being willing to, to sit in front of uh, friendly committees and not so friendly committees to fight for, for what was earned a long time ago and in many cases what was forgotten. Uh, and at the same time, I also appreciate our friends at ERS and Jim and his team and all the effort they've put in because uh, along with the rest of us, they have taken their punches and blows and have, I think, uh, have, have walked through the battle uh, uh, in a dignified manner, respectful and professional manner. And uh, I think both sides have done a lot. We've got a ways to go, but I think we've got the machine moving now. So um, hopefully at some time, whether I'm here in the Senate or not, uh, in the future, that everything is where it needs to be. But thank you all again. And next Wednesday, we will be listening to this legislation for the final time and voting on it and hopefully moving it on uh, to where it needs to be. Thank you all so much. And thank, thank you, you for Chairman. your kind remarks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Much appreciated. Thank you.
Thank you. And we are adjourned.